What's up, guys? Welcome to The Jay Martin Show. My name is Jay Martin, and my guest today is Howard Lindzen, a serially successful entrepreneur, founder, founder of StockTwits, one of the largest global marketplaces for uh, financial Twitter. He is a seed investor in a series of super successful companies, names like Robinhood, for example, made himself a pile of money as an investor. What I wanted to talk to Howard about today is how companies have raised money over the last 10 years versus how they're going to have to during the next 10. And what I'm talking about is a complete revaluation of how growth companies are viewed by the marketplace. So we covered that. I also got Howard's thoughts on where he's allocating capital today after decades of high risk, early stage investing. He's looking at the market differently today. And I wanted to get his thoughts on Musk's takeover of Twitter and what he thought was going on behind the scenes there. Anyways, here is Howard Lindzen. As always, beneath this piece of content, there is a link where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter. I publish every Sunday and I absolutely love writing it. Would love to have you join the team. So hit that link. And, uh, and you'll hear from me every Sunday. Here is Howard Lindzen. Enjoy. All right, guys, welcome back to the Jay Martin Show. And I'm joined right now by Howard Lindzen. Howard, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. I, we both dressed up. We, <laughs> you know what? My audience is giving me crap about that because I used to wear a collared shirt and then I started showing up in a T-shirt and they're calling me out in the comments. But you know what? I felt like I don't, I, I used to run an, an investment conference company, eight to 11 conferences per year. I had an office downtown. I wore a suit every day. But who am I kidding today? You know, if I put a suit on, it's just for the show. Like, it's like a costume at this point. You know, this is how I dress. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I grew up, at, I'm 57, so I grew up when you had to wear a suit. And I remember, I didn't know the rules of the game. And I was, uh, so it was like 19, it's called 91. And I was working as a stockbroker. And so I bought a bunch of suits. Yeah, it's Phoenix, so it's really hot. And, uh, you know, so I remember having to go to a meeting in Dallas to, okay. the, to the head office. And no one told me that there was like, like, that's how bad, that's how serious dress. I took a bunch of short sleeve dress shirts. Just okay. so I melt. Yeah. And I remember like in a big meeting, a big meeting, but like in like a meeting with all the other brokers and my bosses, like I took off my jacket and I was the only one with like a short sleeve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like an, I mean, it was just funny. It was like a Seinfeld moment. So it's like, and now we can wear underwear and no pants. So yeah. the world is, uh, I mean, we can wear, and I'm wearing pajamas. So like I'm an investor personally, first plug, I'm an investor in a company called Jambies, which uh -huh. is kind of like the funniest brand it's like it's like a netflix and chill underwear like it's just underwear for watching netflix that's basically we've given up on life just by jambies yeah. right it's a really yeah, great yeah. comfortable product and i don't wear pajamas so now they have like put my corporate logo on like a pajama sweatshirt uh, and i wear this around a lot and it's just so comfortable like why why do people not wear just pajamas all day you know it's a good question I yeah. struggle with the with the brands. Like once I find a brand that I that fits well, and I just go all in on it, and I'll just order as you should. Just I yeah, it just takes the thought process out of it, right? So my closet is like if it you looks feel like, good, who cares if it's twenty of the same things? Right, I'm with you. On the that idea one. is to be your best self, and if it means wearing the same thing every day, you know, how is that different than taking a drug? Um, so, you know, now a lot of fake people have done that as we've seen the steve jobs copycats and the whatever meaning like it still should be individualized it's not to mean you have to wear a black turtleneck as we saw with their yeah. nose yeah i was gonna um, say yeah yeah but those That's are right. people that just you know they're they're predators but uh but at the same time as an individual and we're seeing this with kids with iphones we're already off topic but you know if everybody has the same hat and shirt in 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 iphone of course they're going to express themselves with watches and the same apple watch no wonder rolexes were popular for kids versus a car and no who had some money and no wonder like thousand dollar shoes were popular it's their only way to flex you know when yeah. i was yeah you had to buy a honda or a pray you had to have a car and a, and now you don't and so who's like all these people making fun of millennials are spending money on LVMH or whatever. It's still a lot better than pissing it away on a car and insurance. And it's just the, 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 the silliness of like labeling things. 
when and, you know I was just talking about this LVMH to burn he's the wealthiest guy in the world and and the tech guys are making fun of him saying it's depressing and I'm like no 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 it's depressing that you guys think that animate like live objects around brand and provenance and luxury are stupid whereas you know us us you know kowtowing to our tech overlords is kind of stupid right like we're gonna yep. someone's gonna be coming for you so I think we live in a world now, you know, 2023, as we enter it, where the signal is not that this is, there's going to be more LVMHs. Like there's going to be people, and we saw it with the Shopify boom and the Alibaba, and that's over a little bit because of Facebook, but you're going to see more companies go LVMH, high margin, high profit, you know, the aloes of the world that are higher priced than Lulu, um, the Rafas of the world in cycling that are higher priced and specialized where you can actually make a living. And if you take care and build great products, people will pay for it. And because of the affinity and millennials do that, right? Whether it's Rolex or Nike or Aloe or LVMH. Yeah. Guess what? They'll cut costs elsewhere. They'll cut costs elsewhere. They're willing think- to live with their parents, which people are making fun of. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but that's, but them spending money in the economy is more productive than putting all their money in the house, which has no productivity, right? Which just sucks resources. So people's thinking is warped and they're putting it all on Gen Z and millennial that it's not, it's not your fault or a Gen Z's fault that they grew up with that magic wand in their hand, um, which is an iPhone. It's not my son's fault that he has Netflix, YouTube. He didn't ask for it. It just is. So of course yeah. we're raising different people. Um, parents still need to be parents and like understand the, the background of all this. So we're seeing some like, this, we are talking at like, this is one of the most interesting times in financial markets, at least since 08. Everything else has just been easy. And so here we are and, and everybody's wrong. And the people that think they're right are just about to be proven they're wrong. And so this is an important time to like really think through what's working and why it's working and how the markets uh, are are going to kick somebody's ass. Like they're out there to kick some ass right now, the markets. And um, it's interesting to see, look at what it's doing to Elon Musk right now. I mean, he's losing $30 billion a day in his baby because he bought Twitter. Right, right. And- now... And he's on Twitter. To... And he's on Twitter saying, "Well, you know, Tesla's going down because of macro conditions." I go, "Well, you're, but you went out in these bad macro conditions and paid forty-four billion dollars for an asset <laughs> worth eight billion. Like, yeah. why am I trusting you? Like, what? Like, you can't talk out of both sides of your ass. Yes, you knew the macro conditions, hence you sold your Tesla stock, which was genius. Then you went out and handed thirty billion to Twitter employees that you thought were stupid and fired them. So you just transferred." 30 billion of your wealth to unhirable Twitter employees. Pretty, pretty interesting moments where everybody's being, the market's just throwing shade at everybody. Yeah. Okay. Now I want to, I want to pick so much of that apart. So, you know, I want to talk about the, the shift, right. And you referenced Howard Mark's recent letter, uh, the seed change, right. And I want to get into that because I feel like you've hinted at a few things there just now, but prior to that, when you talk about, so the founder of LVMH is now the richest person in the world. The significance of this is that, you know, LVMH, for anyone who's not familiar, as I was not, is, you know, an ultra luxury brand distributor, essentially, right? Like, we're talking about champagne, perfume, uh, luxury purses and clothing like Christian Dior, Louis Vuitton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> it struck me as surprising because a trend that I'm seeing, Howard, you let me know if you're seeing this too, is like, you know, a trend towards simplicity and towards, um, I guess, more like primitive asset ownership, right? A trend away from speculative growth companies and towards more um, value generating, uh, dividend paying, you know. But in general, just as a lifestyle shift, I'm watching people moving from sm- from large cities to small towns and simplifying their life a bit, little bit, right? Simultaneously, the richest person in the world is now, you know, the biggest distributor of the most expensive products the world has to offer. And so are there are there two opposing trends and forces at play when, when you think about it like that? No, because we're at the early stage of thinking it through. It may just be a bad data point. Remember, you can torture data to make it seem whatever you want. So, so the only data that we can all look at, and it's the same no matter where we 
look at it from is price data, right? Like, so the reason the stock market's interesting is so many people, Canada, US, rest of the world is you see the Google price, I see the Google price. We can argue about it, but the price is the object, right? <clears throat> Very few industries have that. Um, so that's where the world, you know, that's what the world settles on. Now, because we have, this is where the Howard Marks stuff comes in. And it's not like we'd have to be rocket science. I was buying T-bills four months ago because if you can make four and a half percent in something you were making zero percent in, and you're worried about how you used to make 15% in stocks, uh, you're worried, you're tired of being down 15% or 20%, 4% is a good place to hide out mm. and lick your wounds um, while you, you know, we all, you know, we were all Kathy Woods. Uh, because she wasn't the only one trend following, but you can't be Kathy Woods on the way down. Only Kathy Woods has been Kathy Woods on the way down. A complete bumbling mismanagement and false profit um, because you, know, you can't go up 80% and lose it all. You weren't good, right? And, you hmm. know, so, so that's the era that scares me more than like predicting what's happening next. We, there's, more, there's too many Kathy Woods that I don't know if it's her fault or you know the Fed's fault, but interest rates have changed everything. And I don't know what the hell Kathy Woods is talking about because if she was smart, you know, it, did, it took Howard Marks, he knew this six months ago, but he's clearly expressing it now, is that like interest rates really are the reason. Mm -hmm. And even Elon Musk is saying this in his replies, like it's the Fed. And it's like, Okay, smarty pants, if it was the Fed and you knew it was the Fed and you knew Tesla was going to face headwinds, why are you buying the the riskiest asset in the world, which is run by lunatics uh, with 7,000 employees that will never pay back its bonds? So everybody, no one knows except, you know, the markets and the markets are saying high interest rates give people too many choices that they didn't have before that make it very hard to say, I want to be in stocks. Because four and a half percent is a real alternative, a risk-free alternative. It's fantastic. Now it may not be fantastic if rates go to eight percent, because you know I've, I've wasted all that. You know I've got my money locked up at four and a half percent. I got to wait for it to expire to go get the eight percent. Okay, but it is a great place to hide out because if, if rates do go to eight percent, yes, I'm in short-term notes and I'll go grab the eight percent next year. Definitely won't go into stocks. And if rates go back to 2%, yeah, I miss a great year probably in stocks, but my bonds are worth a lot more as well. So, so in a world where you have choices, not just like the riskiest assets, this isn't just going to change again overnight. That's why he's talking about there being a sea change. And there's just not enough people that have caught on to that. If Howard Marks is just writing about it, and he's one of the best investors of the world, mm -hmm. You and I think about it and go, oh, we read it, we understand, but 99.9% .9 of the other people have not. And so the significance of, you know, calling it a sea change, because you can look at so many trends that are shifting today and think, oh, well, that happens often, right? Markets go up, they go down, interest rates maybe pivot a little bit. But what Howard Marks is talking about is far more significant than you know, in his career of 50 some years, right? He's right. identified two sea changes thus far and believes we may be entering the third, which would be a shift from like the 40 year bull market we've just experienced into whatever comes next, yeah. right? And so if you were to think that through, Howard, you know, what comes next if, if the sea change is as profound as he's explaining huh. it to be? Like what? Yeah. It's a great question. I'll premise everything with I'm 57 years old and pretty wealthy, you know, uh, mostly self-made. Um, so I have choices that other people don't. Sure. I have a home and a vacation home and live in the sun and pay low taxes in Arizona. So like there's, I, you got to put all this stuff in perspective if I'm going to give people like my opinion. You know, my kids are out of the house. They seem happy. Um, yeah. I don't have alimony payments. I'm still married. Uh, I have my health, kind of, and but everything can change like overnight. So I'm 57, closer to my grave, and only thinking about legacy. I'm not thinking about taking extra risk. 
Now, I could think about that until recently, because recently I didn't ever own a bond until like this year. It was like, OK, the your money you sat in your cash, let's say it's a million or 10 or 100, you know, or, 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 or 500K or 10K. If it's 10K, yeah, your money should be in cash. I don't know what to tell you. Like you don't have six months of cash. It's why are you even looking at investing? Like it's fun to read and build a hobby, but like you got to be in cash. You need to survive. Uh, you know, once you get to a net worth of 10 million, you know, and you have the choice of putting 10 million to work in the stock market or venture capital or or leave it in cash, um, you know, the, the, the choices get easier if, if your network is good because you're going to see interesting deals and your choices, man, I'm, you know, if it sits here in cash, I'm staring at it, it's going to be worth the exact same next year. And eventually, if you're smart, enough deals come along the table and slowly you get sucked out of cash into risky assets. That's how bull markets work. Mm -hmm. And in any normal bull market, and none of them are ever the same, uh, in 2019, when we work imploded because SoftBank raised $100 billion and self-marked up we work, and to the point where even Goldman Sachs had a aha moment and said, even we can't take this public. In any normal cycle, that was the top. Meaning, thank goodness, you know, that's the scam that was WeWork. It was just a simple leasing business. Um, and the fact that the Saudis put $100 billion into a fund and NASA was doing stupid checks. Those were kind of the signs of the top. But then COVID happened, right? And instead of a top, which would have been a less painful, you know, looking out to today, we went into like some extreme thing where I definitely couldn't have predicted this. It was, it was fun, but where not only did Masa not blow up, everybody copied Masa, meaning, you know, Andreessen, Insight, at, um, D1, Co2, uh, the, you know, the Arabs, the Russians, the, you know, the Robin Hooders, everybody just went on red or green, right? Like, okay. Like new, new world, right? Um, and it was fun. I mean, who could have predicted it? Like, you know, like when you started your podcast in the spring of 2020 and I started Panic with Friends in March 2020, like I can look back at it and, and be happy that I like, this is a really interesting, you, if you're ever going to buy a stock, you know, March 2020 was going to be your time. I couldn't have predicted where it went. I was just like, if you're not going to buy a stock in March 2020 with the VIX at 80, and the government sending you money, um, you know, and Zoom and Slack and you and all these things that you can do from your home, you may never buy a stock. Okay. But I didn't predict it would be like everybody in the pool and everybody's, you know, buying crypto and tokens and that I couldn't have predicted. So now here we are in 2022, the end of 22, 23, and my cash that used to earn zero, I could put 10 million in a in a nine-month T-bill. And get back four hundred and fifty thousand dollars risk free in nine months. That's real. You could pay for my mom, go to home. I could pay for my kids. You know, you know, if I could spend four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you know, pre tax, but I can go spend that for not doing any work versus trying to take risks. So of course, people my age would be an idiot not to rethink how they're thinking about risk. Okay. Now everybody has their own status around four and a half percent risk-free rate. And that's where we are today though, for people like me, like you're going to have to really show me something interesting to make me part with my cash. Cause I don't think you understand that the game has changed. Now yeah. I could be wrong, but I'm talking like the old man to a lot of young kids saying, I want to raise money at a 20 million valuation and, yeah. and I have no product yet. And I'm an ex Twitter I'm an ex-Twitter engineer. And I'm like, well, that's worth three. And then for two years, they hung up on me. And now they're calling me back saying, can we do it at eight? And I'm like, no, it's it's worth three. Meaning for me to take my money out of T-bills and, and work with you for 10 years, I need to have serious upside. And we're just so not close. This is just be like seed investing, not just stocks. But yeah. we're so far apart that you're making it easy for me to stay in T-bills. So I need, we need to get to the point where something risk reward 
looks like T-bills and the venture market is still so far from reality because they're still living with, uh, what do you call it, with recency bias. How could yes. they not? It's been 15 years of fun. Yeah. Of course, we have yeah, recency yeah. bias. So, so that is our problem, or that is the, the context of which I will invest for the next nine months to one year. And okay. if, hopefully I'm wrong. Like, here's the thing. Hopefully I am wrong and everybody and rates go to zero and everybody gets balloons and lollipops and loads up their Robinhood account and doubles their money. That's fantastic. The economy, you know, prolong the, you know, bear market. I'm good with that. Like, I, you know, I, that I'll be looked at as too cautious, the grumpy old man. But it's okay. I'm 57. Like, I, I understood the, the risk reward. I don't think enough people are, are doing that analysis. So what, what happens then? Because you're probably... And that goes to... back to LVMH, which we'll wrap with, sorry, because I never really probably answered your question, is the margins of change. Now LVMH is Facebook in the sense that some kid who understands collectibles or is online all day knows that if they buy an LVMH thing the first day or line up at a retail store, it's at least worth their time to do that because they can sell it for double on Etsy, wherever they're going to sell it on their Shopify store versus starting a, a, a Shopify store with a towel that they bought on Alibaba and changed, you know, because they now can't acquire a customer to make that margin work. So the margins are such in the LVMH world of the business that people can build businesses within there. And not at the scale that Facebook happened, but so, so more people will want to think through how do I build a high margin product? that maybe doesn't have to sell to a million people, but it could sell to a hundred customers. Yeah. Right? So I think yep. those are the things that interest me is like getting back to the basics. Like, you know, if your only skill is to acquire customers on Facebook, you're out of business, right? Like I wouldn't hire you, but if your skill is, okay, I understand how to write. I understand how to use AI. I understand, not, not coded, but I understand how to get users on TikTok. I understand how to do customer support. I understand how to do A-B testing. I understand how to like acquire users in unique and interesting ways. You are valuable. There's just not enough people trained for that. Everybody's been focused on learning how to do art at NFTs or um, be an engineer at a product person at Facebook or Snapchat yeah. or so the world's just changing very fast right now. We actually need to have a damn good recession. <laughs>
and no one knew that Apple would kill Facebook and that, um, you know, everybody would pull scams on, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Right, so, you know, don't kill yourself. Don't beat yourself up over this stuff. Cause even guys like me who know better made a lot of mistakes, but I can see my mistakes quite clearly by looking at quarterly letters of some of the kids that I gave money to or adults that I gave money to that were supposed to be a fiduciary of my capital and because they be, they were doing stupid things with them. Not only were they doing stupid things, they probably didn't have enough of their own money, but they had the privilege of investing other people's money and continue to do stupid things with it. Yeah. And that is just not going to clean itself up so easily. And and that worries me. So there's so many like things in the private markets that just are messy. And that was part of this extended bull market that we had. The private, the public markets will clear themselves up much quicker than the than the than the private markets. Um, and that's a bummer for guys like me who who spent the last 20 years investing in private markets and now it's like too hot to touch. But like you said, I unfortunately will have to expand my lane. Um, mm -hmm. mostly with my personal money because four percent won't be enough probably forever for my and okay. so yeah but i don't want to for what i see people offering 30 percent risk i think they're joking like they don't have a clue how yeah, bad. yeah so so now we're gonna like the world will move to like you said there'll be a lot of smart people doing roll-ups and acquisitions of struggling companies the world will look differently but it will clean itself up because in the end it's a supply demand world and there was just too much supply of everything, engineers, money, tech, uh, content, uh, stocks, SPACs, startups. So now you got to like get rid of all that supply. And so the people that survive best have businesses that actually work. And now it's just a waiting game and a true skill game of kind of expanding your knowledge base and you got to learn another skill. The skill that worked before is just not going to work. If guys like Howard Marks are saying sea change, we can argue with them, but there is a sea change. Yeah. And he doesn't even know where the money is right to be spent, which is why I'm hiding out in T-bills and giving up nine months of like up down volatility to just say, at least I know if I put 10 million in T-bills, I got 450 grand back in nine months. You can yeah. get planning around that. So what you're saying, you know, I've heard that a few times from people, for example, a really good friend of mine just had a life-changing exit from his business. You know, the best guy in the world that, that could have happened to, he was a grinder for 40 years, got his, got his ticket clipped. Now he's sitting on a pool of cash and has no idea what to do with it, right? And he's facing a bigger challenge than maybe running his business for the last 40 years. And that, where do you put a uh, sum of cash that is, you know, and he's out of, he's, He's scared in every direction because no matter where you look, there's a lot of unprecedented volatility. If you're sitting on the sidelines, and that's what you sitting in T-bills is right now, um, you know, where are you curious though? Like where are you looking for opportunity? What would get you to take some cash out of T-bills and go to that next, that next entrepreneur? You know, what's the industry? What's the, what's the guarantee or the promise of the plan that would get you excited at this point? Well, my day job is social leverage. So we have a, um, we invest one to two million dollar checks. Uh, that's my job into seed stage startups. So, so like I said, the last three years were somewhat easy. Uh, they were hard in the sense of FOMO, but they were easy in the sense of like we're used to writing a one or two million dollar check at a six million valuation for us, for two founders and kind of a finished product. And we were generally writing checks at six to eight million pre. Okay. okay. But for the last two years, those were 20 million per year, 25 million per year. So it was just like, okay, we, we're out of business. And so, like I said, I did some stupid things with my own money while I waited, just in case, you know, just to keep my network, you know, the oil flowing in the network, right? And whoops, probably not was not good use of my personal capital. Um, but I didn't want to blow up the franchise, but like, it's very hard to, it'd be, it's much easier to explain to my LPs today that, hey, we had a hundred million to invest and we only spent, we only invested 25% of it. You know, two years ago, they would have said, you're lazy. Uh, you don't know what you're doing. Why are you podcasting? Uh, shouldn't you be working? Cause FOMO was on the other side. The investors had FOMO. Yeah. As a steward of capital, I was like, I don't get it. So I'm not, you know, I'll put some of my own money to work because I'm an idiot. 
and just in case schmuck insurance, but I can't write LP check. Now those people are grateful and they're like, you're smart. And I don't know if I'm smart. It's just, I didn't understand the game or the game changed so far. It made it easy to avoid the game because the rules were just, everything was so far away from reality for me. So I kind of got lucky, let's call it, not smart. But now it's like the game's changed and now those things are back to near the, the price that we're tempted to do see. But let's remember now the, the, the playing field, 4% interest rates versus zero, four and a half percent versus zero. Apple and Google are our overlords. So if you're gonna build an app, it ain't gonna be like Uber or Airbnb anymore. And you're not gonna grow into China and you're not going to do deals with the Russians, and you're not going to go into LATAM, and Europe's a mess. So you have de deglobalization, and you have valuation compression. So yes, two years ago, I would have written this check at six to eight, but maybe it should just be four. And then two years ago, you could raise four million and have three years worth of runway, but I'm now I'm like, why can't you just take 500 grand and prove this point? Because if you execute, we'll help you find more money. So there's so much re-education that has to happen because of bad habits. It's not just about valuations now. It's about it's about expectations of what you're supposed to do with my money. And, and you know, with this one year of capital, you need to get these three things ticked off. But for the last three years, people were raising three years of capital. So like, no, you know, the best actor and producer in the world don't get three years to make a movie. They get one year to make a movie. But yet startups over the last few years were getting five years of money. Yeah. You know, I mean, that is just was so it's hard for me to explain how dumb the, the whole thing was. Can I ask you, Howard, you know, after no, I'm not again, like I, I, this is just one commenter's point. Like I still made a lot of mistakes. I'm just saying I can't believe how far from reality things got. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, let me ask you as as you're investing your time at this stage in your career, you've had a number of uber successful wins in the market, yeah. seed investments in companies like Robinhood, for example, yeah. you know, some business exits in addition. Um, what's motivating you to do things like launch a podcast, uh, produce an almost daily newsletter, right? Which is remarkable. I publish a weekly and I have trouble finding time to do it. You know, what's, what's inspiring you to spend time on content creation at this point in your career cycle? Well, I mean, I'm probably not well spent. I mean, I, love, I mean, my wife reads it, my daughter. So, so it's kind of a check, <laughs> like the people that we're arguing about all day on Twitter, Elon Musk and the left and the right and the journalists are like, they, I don't understand them. Their whole point, like everybody's lost the script. I write for me, right? Yep. Like I, don't, I don't write for traffic. It'd be nice when it's something well read if I knew how to get it more traffic. But again, that's not really my job. My job is to tell our story of how we think. And then other smart people, because the way the internet works and search works, other smart people will self-select and find me. So it's kind of like my job. Luckily, I like my job. And it's not a struggle for me. Yeah, it's a couple hours a day, but it's not as part of my job. It's not a struggle that I wake up and have something that I have to share. I'm lucky to be surrounded by people that like tell me I'm an idiot. And not every day, but like, hey, Howard, you're full of yourself. You need to talk because they can see me every day online. And I know when I've overstepped my boundaries. Doesn't seem like some of the people that we've given all this power and trust to have those things around them, whether it's family or kids. And there's this lack of shame uh, for some reason uh, went all the way up to the presidency and now it's the richest people in the world. They're shameless, you know? And I don't know how that came about, but like, it's not a good spot, you know, to be in. So my job is to just keep people around that like, tell me what it is and how it is, but also keeping the right people around me that let me be you be instinctual and um be open to like fresh ideas so what interests me now is is if the world's changed i always was fascinated by brands and fashion and tech from apple to oakley to lulu to aloe to nike lvmh i'm fascinated by brands and Nike, like if you, if you read 
you know, Phil Knight's book, I mean, how can you not be fascinated by that business? You know, it took him 10 years to get to 10 million in revenue. How many kids today are willing to work 10 years to get to 10 million in revenue? Oh, and by the way, leave your family, become a drunk, fly to Asia, you know, do crazy ass impossible deals, build factories. Kids today want to be, they want a 10 million valuation because of, because they have an iPhone. Yeah. Um, so yeah. again, like, you know, I'm inspired by like good stories and good people and good storytelling. And there's just millions of those out there, luckily. So it's hard not to be inspired, actually. It's just, you've got to put the vibe out. Right? And so our, my blog and my tweets and stock tweets are my way of saying, hey, man, I'm approachable. Now, a lot of 19, 20 year old kids read my blog. Okay. And then guess who I engage with? Those, if they read my blog and get the joke or get the context, of course, I'm going to call them back because you can't fake that. Like I write to such a narrow type of thinker mm-hmm. in community that if you're engaged, I don't care what age you are, you're pretty smart. Right. Um, and if I can, so if you're reaching out to me, I, that's part of my community, then I, I'm interested in like why you thought this was interesting. It's very hard to fake liking my stuff because it's weird. And, um, so I have a, this big network of smart people at all different ages that send me ideas. And I also only write about the things that I'm interested in for the most part. Therefore, I attract interesting ideas, whether it's golf, cycling, software, um, stocks, markets. So generally, like it's curious, like I don't see everything, but the stuff that gets sent to me is generally on point. So no, I mean, there's no slowdown in like ideas that excite me. It's just, how do you price it? You know, what's the founder's goal? Like, should this be a venture deal? Is there a different way to look at it? Kind of like using my experience to really guide people of how hellish it will be if they take my money and our money, meaning here's our expectations. Whereas like when you're starting out, it's like, oh my God, let's, you're in love and let's do a deal. Now it's more like, let me tell you how hard this is going to be. Let me yep. be the old man pointing his finger saying, did you know the interest rates are 4%? Did you know that like, you're never going to get a billion dollar valuation? And I don't care what other people tell you. Do you, do you, know, you know what I mean? Did you know you're not going to open a China office ever? Uh, you know, like, and if they're willing to understand all that and they really have domain experience and we can see each other spending, you know, 10 years together in boards or in text messaging, if we can get through all that, then yeah, I'm excited. I'm always excited to write a check and we're always looking to write checks. But now we're just more, everybody needs to be more honest about like what it takes to get to the goal line. And, yeah. and that's just, just some more brute, you know, honesty of what the markets are going to bash into people's heads. And so the faster founders find those people and are honest to themselves about the journey and the faster good VCs tell the story of what it's going to be like to those young people the faster we can get to a point where we're investing again uh and so in the meantime there's a lot of false signal and a lot of like bad deals more than usual because there's just that much money out there right let me let me ask you because you've mentioned musk a few times especially in the context of twitter and you could look at this guy two ways you could look at him as the guy who disrupted the banking industry with paypal then disrupted the auto industry then disrupted the space travel industry and now is taking a crack at media, right? That's one way to look at him. The other way, which is the way Twitter sentiment tends to look at people and Musk right now is that, well, Tesla's down 70%, uh, Twitter's become a mess and he's already stepping down as CEO. This guy's impulsive and out of control and doesn't know what he's doing, which I struggle. I'm just going to show my cards here. I think that's so ridiculous when you look at the track record of somebody over the last 25 years and they make a judgment call in six months. And first of all, who are you to criticize? Did you do any of that stuff? But, you know, are you long or are you short Elon Musk in, in this scenario? Because the, the market t- tends to tear him apart based on what he did yesterday. And I think completely lose sight of the previous two decades and probably what the next two decades might look like. But what, what do you think? Well, I'm a fan of anybody that like can make shareholders money. Like that is his job. Yeah. Right. So take away everything else as a CEO's job is to return capital to shareholders. How do you argue with those numbers? But now the world's different. 
I mean, mm. there's people that bought the stock at four hundred dollars. Like, yeah, that's just reality. Like, you know, we can get all day of like, oh, I think he's an idiot, or I don't think he's a genius. And depending on where you bought the stock, there's going to be fans. But yeah. there's also now a lot of people that are buried. So the oh, world yeah. is going to finally have people that have a different objective, which is like the fucking guy sucks as the CEO, right? Yeah, this yeah. did not exist. So you and I can't have this debate because there's just too many people that have just entered the Musk world six months ago and bought the Kool-Aid and think yeah. like they're fucking freaking out. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen to those people because he feels like he's lost his mind, meaning he already won media. Because he didn't own Twitter and own Twitter. So, so that's the only part that doesn't make sense to me. When you have that many followers and can move the markets and you don't have to pay the employees, and you don't have to argue with people, you don't have to fire 7,000 people or carry a sink into the headquarters. Yeah, yeah. You'd already won. So that's my problem with, that's where I scratch my head. It's like, what, what do you want to prove? So it's so so now I believe. And then the other thing that I have a problem with Elon Musk is free speech. I had a problem with Jack, I had a problem with the board. I have a problem with anybody that wraps a, a business discussion around free speech. Because in the end, he was buying a business or what he thought was a business. So the whole fucking lie of you know free speech just pisses me off. Because I, you know, I've run a social network and started one, and it's definitely at subscale or at scale well below Twitter. So I've seen everything that he's seen, just at not the same volume. Mm -hmm. I've been called a fascist for kicking somebody off stock Twitch. And so I know what it feels like to be called a fascist, not at scale. Sure. And I've also been called a hero, and I'm not a hero, right? I'm just a guy who doesn't like being called either. And for some reason, he likes being called both. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something wrong with the man in my weird interpretation of Elon Musk, meaning he now has a problem that a lot of people are buried. And I feel that that's a new feeling for him. He's always sure. been the underdog. He's always been the guy that could deliver. Yes. And, and now he's in a new uh, coliseum or a new group of gladiators that have nothing to lose. They're just throwing spears from the crowd, right? And I'm just finishing up, up, up. and he's engaging with the lunatics. Ooh. Like even I don't do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? And yeah. I'm trying to build audience. He has nothing to win and he's still fighting with, he's fighting below his, he's punching down every day. Like, is it winning if you're at the World Cup with Jared Kushner? Like, at any whether you love politicians, whether you love the Saudis or not, is that winning? Like, go to the game with two of your kids and don't share your location and like put on a hat, like celebrities used to do, you know, and big sunglasses and enjoy the game. No, like it still had to be about he just kicked people off for doxing and then self doxed himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So again, I don't believe anything he says anymore. And, and I think part of that is just the, the pressure of now he has shareholders who are down 50%. Now, and could there be like, we talked about this, this changing of the tide, right? And uh, insane valuation growth stocks are probably going to be a thing of the past for the time being. And could he be ahead of that curve with Twitter? Meaning, you know, he took this company and then took it private. He uh, right away addressed the fact that they were going to be implementing a hardcore work culture. And if he didn't want to be in the office. No, he, he did a great thing. He got a great service for guys like me who are venture capitalists who talk to founders over there. I go, you see what he did? We're yeah, I just want to. If he's getting stuff, he just ran. It's like an army. He just ran military cover for you to fire 70 percent of your staff. Like totally. You could, yes. You could disagree with his style, but like there's a smart entrepreneur. And mm. just said the world's coming to an end. You can wrap it in any. Yeah. I mean, that's why I like Elon Musk because I know how mm -hmm. to read between the lines. 99% mm -hmm. of the public seems like they don't know how to read between the lines. So they're reading the wrong things. Sure. And that's, and that's what I worry about. Like, yes, I appreciate Elon Musk giving me cover on every board call I say to say, hey, I don't know what you guys are doing, but Elon Musk just forgetting style he just fired way late 70 percent of the people and i think we could all agree he probably could have fired more at twitter sure and the twitter files prove that like he didn't yeah he didn't make me he didn't give me any new information with twitter files a poorly run company 
the inmates were running the asylum. And of course, email looks every, makes everybody look bad in hindsight. If every one of our emails is under the microscope of someone like Elon Musk, who has a point to prove, you're not going to come out looking good. Yeah. And, it, and, and for those people that like are throwing judgment around, you're all going to end up in a deposition one day. Hopefully not, but normal human beings end up in one or two depositions during their life. And those are not pleasant, whether you're innocent or guilty, because <laughs> under the shade of a lawyer and like spin, uh, you never look good. So, uh, you know, so yes. I, I don't want to judge Elon on that stuff because he's like in real time, but I will judge his behavior and it doesn't make sense to me. And if sure. I was a shareholder, which I'm not, I'd be pissed. And that's all I can judge him on. And I think, yeah. but if you're going to look at the 50 year plan, yeah, he'll probably work his way out of it. Well, but, that, that's okay. That's a good way to look at it. Cause I think there's never it's never binary people's personalities and character traits aren't binary and the same traits that just he seems to say yes and then charge there's Very a million ways for him to work his way out of it i just don't know who's going to get screwed yeah okay good point yeah okay good point. so avoid yeah. the battle like there's yeah. better there's easier battles now will so, i have fun and make fun of him and do that that's my that's twitter yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. or yeah. hate me because i'm goofing on elon musk they don't have yeah. the context i get it like i you know sure. but i don't I don't hate the, it's just, I just, I'm, I, I'm a lot. Twitter is a place to be an armchair quarterback on every subject, on everything in real time. That's Twitter. They should, they should call them, change the name to armchair quarterback. Okay. Everybody gets to be the QB. Everybody gets to be the head coach. Everybody gets the CEO. Everybody gets to be, uh, look at stocks and second guess each other. Everybody gets to be a money manager. I mean, what a great product. Mm -hmm. Like I can get the sex appeal and why he's an addict. It's a drug. Yeah. But he yeah. bought the cocaine factory. I don't know. <laughs> it's like a bad idea. <laughs> if you're a coke addict and you buy a cocaine manufacturing facility, probably not the best idea. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. All right. Look, this is fun. Does that makes sense to you at least. Like, I don't want to be an asshole, but does that make sense? No, it absolutely. It does. And I, I think that uh, the same traits that have made him as successful as he is are, are the same traits that make him very difficult to understand, land him in piles of trouble all the time, uh, simultaneously just destroy wealth generation, wealth of a lot of his shareholders. Yeah, because, let's be honest. He's destroyed yeah. some serious wealth. You blame it on the a lot of dope. You can blame it on whatever. He's destroying and transferring a lot of stupidity and wealth yeah. and a lot of hate and anger. And I'm not appreciative of that. Or I'm not yeah. allowed to say that. Like, I don't, that's, yeah. you, can, you can be two things. Like, you can be Absolutely. a grand and a dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I am sometimes, you know. Um, but I also have skin in the game and I, have, I run stock twits and then it fucking pisses me off. I'm like, right. dude. You don't know everything. I, like, call me. I'll help you. When I'm there. Instead, he's gauging with lunatics on the web. Yeah. Like, that's not a good use. So anyway, that's, it's not about Elon Musk. Twitter is an incredible product. I feel it's in way better hands than where it was. So I'll be on the record with that. Sure. Jack was terrible. The exec, the board was terrible. We can see from the Twitter files that people literally had nothing to do except decide on stupid, like, just wage war on people. Um, yeah. that's what will happen. That would happen at StockTwits if we let that happen, right? Yeah. But we have a simple set of rules. As if, this goes back to how we can get back to reality. Some rules based. You don't need 70 pages of terms of use. Once you get past one page of rules, <laughs> it gets pretty hard to run anything. Whether yeah. it's a YouTube comment section or whether it's StockTwits or Twitter, right? Less rules, the easier is to say, listen, I think you're in bio. There's like rule six rules i see three that you're i don't even need to go to page two can you please behave yeah yeah yeah. and twitter became a hundred pages of of terms of use mm -hmm. and therefore everybody could throw shade on and you know and elon hasn't done anything to fix that he's actually led confusion there uh, again no problem with the confusion no problem with how he's running it his house his rules but when you when you say free speech mm. That's what mm -hmm. threw me off. I'm like, I don't believe you know it. I definitely don't know it. I don't like you should be in charge of it, or I should be in charge of it, or the government should be in charge of it. We have amazing free speech in this country, by the way. Like, I'm mm -hmm. that. We have Canada, US, we get to say shit. Yeah. 
Yeah. Taking away Twitter is not about free speech. You got YouTube, you got Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp, Facebook. I just fucking hate that free speech thing. Twitter's just a product and it's a privilege. And not enough people are treating it as a privilege. They're treating it as a right. And that's just bananas. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. You and I have this right to convert. And yeah. YouTube has the right to not to say this is not by their rules. Mm -hmm. you know, we would post it somewhere else. And sure. if you act like Alex Jones, enough people will just say, I just don't want you here. Shitting yep. in my it's like the Nile River. If everybody shits in the river, you it'll cause blindness for the next eventually people will get go blind drinking the water. Yeah. <laughs> and Twitter has become the Nile River if you don't know how to drink it. And yeah. uh, so I, I don't blame people for kicking people if it's your Star Twitch has kicked a lot of people off its platform, maybe for things and maybe we shouldn't have kicked them off for. Our risk of kicking someone off the platform is they become the biggest celebrity on another platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a huge risk. Yes, yeah. So that's the risk. It is often the case when big names are exited from Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Right, it's the best thing for their brand. In the best longer. thing for their brand. So, quit, yeah. you know, like people are making adult decisions, and and it's just you know, we're, Twitter is an amazing product. I hope it survives. I'm rooting for whoever's in charge. I will call out stupid behavior like free speech and all these people like hiding behind like fake, you know, ideas. Twitter's just yeah. a great product that we should, we're lucky to have. Much like YouTube, fucking amazing product. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Look, Howard, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on. I know you got to jump, um, but I appreciate your time. And I'd yeah, happy to, to do it again. again. I love talking about markets. I can, we kind of, kind of got off subject, but you know, this is a really interesting moment in like investing history. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know, with LVMH, with Howard Marks, with Elon Musk, you know with ftx you know with yeah who knows she's going she went to jail with yeah. with you know what i mean another election in two years with all the debt like with china with russia i mean we are talking about some really interesting moments and like i don't know if people we, people really need to gear up and like find their right network of people and like polish it and fine tune it who they're following who they're listening to because it was it was pretty easy the last 10 15 years yeah 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 that's kind of how i think about it like the next often i get asked like you know what do you expect over the next few years in the markets or whatever and it's it's like there's way too much fluidity to make any sort of forecast that i would really lean into like I, if i had one is that the 2020s are going to be at the 2020s have been it's just sort of yeah. continued unprecedented volatility and uncertainty and i think we're just getting started here given all the factors you just laid out like geopolitical factors monetary policy factors market forces all the stuff demographic shifts that are occurring globally yeah. like there's a lot of play right now which kind of makes i don't i don't i'm not in t-bills but like i guess my version of that is is hard assets right and so i, I i'm over but hard assets are non but they're non they don't produce any kind of value no yeah. so that's yeah, not good exactly. for the economy it's great no for yield and I don't know feel, but like that doesn't help the world do anything i might not be helping the world yeah no no no. i'm not i'm just saying <laughs> that is interesting it doesn't yeah. interest me I mean, yeah, I'm not bearish. I feel like we've passed the volatility. Now it's yeah, the reality. Yeah, so okay. I think like, okay, zero interest rates, like the sea change, like now that there's choice, we already had the volatility. We just switched from zero to never seeing zero again. So we that's why that last year was so volatile. Now the trends have changed and I mean, you're not going to get your money back at Tesla. I don't know, won't see $400 again. It just won't. Unless... Yeah. They, you know, like, of course they could, but not on the path they're on. Yeah. With four or five percent. He's saying so himself. Um, and he's selling his own stock down, down 70 percent. So come on. But but I'm not scared because I know that like there's opportunity. It's just different. And so I think the volatility is probably passed. What I think now comes is real pain from people not like they of understanding now there's new ways to make money. And the same things that worked before, yeah, aren't going to work before. 
And I think you can easily find new mentors and people to follow on YouTube, Star, Twitch, Twitter that have, you know, been more right than wrong and understand this reality. And those people pounding the table, like Kathy Woods, I think we can all agree that the emperor has no clothes, right? She, didn't, she, didn't, she wasn't a good steward of capital. She was just a gambler. And we need to get past that and find good mentors on the web and use these products, forgetting how Elon's using it, use it for the way it should be used, which is to like find people that could help you go faster and get you to where you want to go. We actually need to have a damn good recession. The Russian economy is a gas station run by the mafia. $41 trillion has been created out of nothing. There's a stranglehold in China on most of these resources. The outlook and fundamentals for the metals remains very, very strong. 